Hello, everybody. My name is Patrick Griffin, working together with my good friend, Danny Contreras from Keys to Life. And today we want to bring a short video on what the Bible tells us about the Trinity. And I want to begin with a question. <clears throat> am I reading the Bible for myself or am I letting a teacher or a church organization read the Bible for me? To say that in another way, does my knowledge of any subject in the Bible depend on what the verses themselves are saying or on what a teacher or a church organization is saying about the verse? We can have certainty that we stand safely on God's truth only if our knowledge depends on direct observation of the Word of God. The proper role of a teacher is to the side, assisting us in making direct, organized encounters with what the verses themselves are saying and with what the verses are saying about each other. But a teacher usurps the role of the Holy Spirit when Christians allow a teacher or a church organization to get between us and the Bible so that the scriptures are filtered to us through the theological commitments and hermeneutical processes of the teacher. And one strong example would be that if we were living as Christians a thousand years ago, nearly all of us would believe that when we die, we go to purgatory. We would believe this, not because we had read it for ourselves in the Bible, but because we would have been trusting our teachers and our church organization to read and interpret the Bible for us. And if somebody had come along raising a challenge to our belief in purgatory, we would likely have pulled back and regarded that person as a threat. So with these observations in mind, I want to begin by looking at the saying of Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 30. I and my Father are one. When we hear this expression, our minds can instinctively incline to the idea of this oneness in the way that we might think of one apple, one car, one person. But if we set out on this assumption, we start coming across so many Bible verses that bring us into conflict with that way of thinking about the oneness of God. Now, one example would be in Jesus' prayer for the disciples in John chapter 17, verse 22, when Jesus petitions the Father that they, referring to the disciples, may be one just as we are one. He uses the plural pronoun they in connection with oneness, that they may be one. And no sensible reader is going to think Jesus is praying for all of us to become one person, but rather that we may become one in union just as the Father and the Son are one in union, that they may be one just as we are one. He uses the, when he uses the plural pronoun we in reference to the Father and himself, he gives us powerful footing for thinking of the oneness of God as a perfection of union rather than a singularity of person. And with that on the table, I want to look at other verses where our Lord Jesus Christ uses personal pronouns for the clearest possible uses of language to build our way of thinking, our understanding of the oneness of God. In John chapter 17, verse 5, Jesus prays to the Father saying, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And I want to call attention again to Jesus' use of basic language expressions, the personal pronouns you and me. Even a young child understands the difference between what the word you points to and what the word me points to. So we are not dealing here with ambiguous 
or mystical plays on words, but with the straightforward use of basic language expressions. So I want to go back just a few pages to John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, where Jesus says to the disciples, And I will pray the Father that he will give you another helper that he, using the third person pronoun he to refer to the Holy Spirit, may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. In these verses, Jesus refers to himself by the first person pronoun I and to the Holy Spirit by the third person pronoun he. And again, even a child knows the difference between what the word I points to, what the word you points to, and what the word he points to. <clears throat> so how does, well, how does a child know this? Because God has designed our brains to grip the meaning of basic language expressions. God has communicated to us through language. He's given us the Bible so that we can know him and his plan of salvation and his will for our lives. Like he says in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24, let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. But how can we have confidence that we truly know him unless we can count on the most basic use of words in the Bible, meaning what they say? If Jesus' use of the pronouns you, me, and he is a mystical way of referencing himself, how can we have confidence that anything else in the Bible means what it says? If you, me, and he is a riddle referring to one person, then how do we know the entire Bible is not a riddle? So it really comes back to the question, am I reading the Bible for myself or am I letting someone else read the Bible for me? By the, the clearest expressions of language, how can I, if I'm basing my knowledge on direct observation of what the verses themselves are saying, then as a matter of fundamental cognitive function, I can identify three distinct persons in the triune perfection of God. And I can only miss this point if I allow a foreign power of intelligence, such as teachers from a church organization, to dictate what my mind is loading into the words my eyes are reading. So having placed these observations in plain sight, appealing to common sense and a reliance on the most clear and consistent use of basic language expressions in the Bible, I want to look at just a few verses out of the many that could be used to demonstrate the deity of the Holy Spirit, the deity of Jesus Christ, and the distinctions of persons in the triune oneness of God. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21, identify the Holy Spirit as the one who inspired the writers of Scripture. The verses read, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Clearly, the writers of Scripture were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So if all Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit and all Scripture is inspired by God, then by common sense conclusion, we have direct biblical witness that the Holy Spirit is God. Also in Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, where the scripture records the incident of a man named Ananias lying about his offering to the church, the verses read, But Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit 
and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. In lying to the Holy Spirit, he lied to God, establishing once again the deity of the person of the Holy Spirit. And concerning the deity of the person of Jesus Christ, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, referring to Jesus, says, Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 25, and chapter 46, verse 5, God said, To whom shall I be equal? To whom will you liken me and make me equal? Who can be equal with God? But here in Philippians, Jesus Christ is presented as equal with God, and only God can be equal with God. In becoming a man, as a person, he subordinated himself to the Father so that as a man he could say, my Father is greater than I, and the scripture can even say that he was made a little lower than the angels for a while, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But in his deity, he never ceased to be equal with the Father. And as just one more observation on the uncreated deity of Christ, I want to read the first three verses of the Gospel of John. The verses read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. I want to call special attention to the ending of the third verse, referring to Christ, without him nothing was made that was made. If Christ himself were made, this verse would implode. The Bible bears explicit and repeated witness to the deity of the person of Jesus Christ, to the deity of the person of the Holy Spirit, and the Bible is loaded up with testimony on the distinctions of persons in the triune oneness of God, such as in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 12, which reads, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. By reading the Bible for ourselves, basing our knowledge on direct encounters with the Word of God. This passage on the baptism of Jesus provides openly verifiable testimony of the simultaneous presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in one event. So that if somebody says, well, you know, you see, Jesus is the Father, but sometimes he manifests himself as the Son, sometimes as the Father, other times as the Holy Spirit. This passage obliterates such an idea of who Jesus is. The language of the passage transparently presents the simultaneous manifestation of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at the same time in the same event. Now, this does not answer all of the questions about the mystery of the Trinity, but it does establish the fact of the Trinity. And again, in Acts chapter 7, verse 55, on the martyrdom of the disciple Stephen, the scripture reads, But he, that is Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Here again is the simultaneous presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, powerfully contradicting 
any claim that the oneness of God is a singularity of person and contradicting any claim that Jesus is the Father. So there's a lot that we have not covered. There are many questions we have not answered. And there are questions about the Trinity that no human can answer. The scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29 tells us, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things that are revealed belong to us. And what belongs to us is the revelation that Jesus our Lord is uncreated deity existing in triune perfection eternally with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is the Jesus who is not the Father and the Jesus who is not the Holy Spirit, but the Jesus to whom every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the scripture warns against those who will come preaching a different Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4. Whatever you have heard from any teacher or church organization about who Jesus is, I urge you to test all things by direct encounter with the word of God. We cannot al safely allow any person or church organization to get a position between us and the Bible. Search it out for yourselves. Put to the test whatever you have heard about Jesus so that you can be sure you have come to the Jesus of the Bible and not to a Jesus of human imagination. The Jesus of the Bible. He is the narrow way. He is the only way. Come to him.